in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament lesson for the 15th Sunday after Pentecost is written in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, beginning at verse 10. It is the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver and the smith as material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence, or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring it to court. For what you will, for what will you do in the end, when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself, and do not reveal another secret, lest he who hears you bring shame upon you, and your ill repute have no end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please turn over to the dragon. We will speak it responsibly. Fear the Lord, you his saints. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers them out of the The epistle is written in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in high honor among you, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same, yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest and as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping a watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
at Luke, the 14th chapter, begin with the first verse. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by you. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene <coughs> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten of not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our message today is our epistle lesson, Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 17. Here we'll be reading this portion. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is our text. Dear friends, in Christ Jesus, what does sacrifice look like? What picture comes to mind when you hear that word? Could it be the picture of a baby that is born, takes time to take care of that child? Middle of the night feedings, diapers to be changed, diapers to be bought, college funds to be established. Sacrifices are made in terms of time and money every parent who has a child. Or how about the picture of two Marines in a battle? They have taken cover in a ditch, a grenade lands between them. One looks at the other, smiles, and jumps on it. He sacrifices his life for his fellow soldier. Or how about the picture of a man in a Muslim country becoming a Christian? He will sacrifice his family, work, freedom, maybe even his life for his faith. These are various pictures of what sacrifice may look like. I bring this up because today's epistle lesson focuses our eyes on Christ's sacrifice and then calls upon us to sacrifice ourselves. That is a remarkable request. To be able to do it, we will need to know what sacrifice looks like. So let's go back, way back, thousands of years. Making a sacrifice was a huge part of temple worship during Old Testament times. In the centuries before Jesus was born, the Jews made sacrifices, lots of sacrifices. They sacrificed all sorts of animals, bulls, sheep, sheep, goats, doves, pigeons, they sacrificed grain and crops. They had sacrifices to give thanks, sacrifices for peace, sacrifices to go with prayers, and especially meaningful to our discussion today, sacrifices to take away sin and guilt. In fact, the most important day in all of Jewish life was a day of sacrifice for sin and guilt. It's called the Day of Atonement. On this day, a goat was sacrificed, and its blood was taken into the holiest place in the temple. It was offered to God as a way to atone for, to make up for, bring forgiveness for the people's sins. Imagine what a sacrifice looked like on the Day of Atonement. Blood. Lots of blood everywhere. On the altar, staining the wood and stone, blood on the ground and sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place in the temple. And then the body of that goat was burned outside the city, outside the sacred place. What did sacrifice look like in Old Testament times? Lots of blood and fire and smoke. And many of the Old Testament sacrifices were made to bring forgiveness for sin and to take away the people's guilt. But then the day came when all those animal and grain sacrifices were no longer needed. The day came when one sacrifice was made that rendered all those other sacrifices obsolete. The day came when Jesus made a once-for-all time sacrifice. Let's begin to see what his sacrifice looks like. 
And to help in that regard, I brought a little visual today, this picture that hangs in my office. Now, if you're a very good Lutheran, sitting way, way in the back, you might not see it quite as well as these others who sit in the front. But the altar in Jesus' sacrifice wasn't made of stone, it was made of wood. Wood in the shape of a cross. And on that cross, blood is shed. Jesus' blood. But notice the irony, the reversal. See, on the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice was made in the temple in the most holy place. It was then burned outside the holy places in, in a defiled, unclean place. Jesus was sacrificed outside in the unclean, defiled place so that you and I could enter the most holy place of God's presence. What do you picture in your mind? How do you picture this once for all sacrifice? All of us probably have in some picture in our minds of the crucifixion. Now years ago, I saw this picture hanging in a Christian bookstore, and having some extra money at the time, I bought it from my office. I don't know exactly how to describe what drew me to this particular painting. It doesn't depict a lot of bloodshed necessarily, which certainly would be more in keeping with the theme of our epistle. But what I feel it does depict is the crushing weight of our sins upon Jesus as he made his way to the cross. It is a picture that reminds me of what Jesus was willing to endure on my behalf. The lacerations on his back, which if you look close, you can see from the whippings. The blood staining his clothes, the crown of thorns. It is really just a snapshot in time, but it captures Christ's sacrifice for us. And I know that after the moment depicted in this painting, there will be more blood, much more. Blood would ooze out of the nail holes in his hands and drip down his wrists and his arms. Blood from the nail holes in his feet would creep down the cross and onto the ground. Blood would be rolling down his side where a spear had punctured him. And in the end, the sacrifice would be over. Jesus committed himself to his Father in heaven. I find this picture meaningful because it helps me to remember what Jesus' sacrifice looked like. And along with that remembrance, I hope to never lose sight. And I hope that you never lose sight of why Jesus made the sacrifice. He did this to take away the sin of the world. His sacrifice was to atone for our guilt. Jesus sacrificed his life so that we might live eternally with him. On the altar of the cross, his blood was shed so that we would be clean in God's eyes. The writer to the Hebrews says, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. We come into God's holy presence only because Jesus has made us holy, sanctified us by his holy blood shed on the cross. Jesus' sacrifice is the only one that makes all those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament mean anything at all. Jesus' sacrifice is the only sacrifice that sanctifies us before God. Jesus' sacrifice is once for all and for all times. And yet, the time for making sacrifices is not over. Oh, it's over for gaining forgiveness, for being made clean and sanctified in God's eyes, those sacrifices for forgiveness and atonement are done. We can't add any sacrifice to what Jesus did on the cross. But other sacrifices are still to be made. Listen again to verses 15 and 16 of our text. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, 
the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We still make sacrifices to God, the sacrifice of praise with our lips, the sacrifice of doing good and sharing what we have. Now what do those sacrifices look like? I think of the ways we offer the sacrifice of praise with our lips. Like this morning, hymnals open, singing together, the words of the creed spoken out loud as we confess our faith in the triune God. On those Sundays when the choir sings a praise song about Jesus, shaking hands, saying good morning, and sharing the love of God at the end of the worship service. But it doesn't have to be just here at church. Heads bowed down before a meal to say thank you for the food, whether you're eating at home or at Pat and Jerry's. Telling someone about Jesus at work or at school, saying thank you, Lord, throughout the day for the wonderful gifts he gives us daily. I'm sure you can picture in your own mind what the sacrifice of praise with our lips looks like. Now, for the sacrifice of doing what is good, the writer to the Hebrew gives us a list of good things to do, ways to give of our time and our money, to sacrifice of ourselves and the way we live. And I want us briefly to look at the examples he lists, none of them in any great detail. But for example, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. What that means is we are family. We care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We sacrifice time and money to make Trinity Monitor our home. We share our brotherly love by praying with and for one another, by supporting our Stephen Ministry Program of Christian Caring, by, by serving at a funeral dinner, by sending a card to a shut-in. It, it would take hours to spell out all the various ways that we can show brotherly love to one another. In verse 2, show hospitality. We provide for those in need, like when we donate to the food bank of Auburn, or supply Christmas gifts to Lutheran children and family services. The ladies of our peacemakers who make quilts that go to Lutheran world relief. In verse 3, remember those who are in prison. Certainly, even those who are, have done wrong need to be cared for and treated with respect. There's a ministry in our Lutheran church called the Forgotten Man Ministries that works in our prison system, sharing the gospel of Christ. And they need our support. But there are also those around us in prison. By poor choices they've made over the years, we need to remember and care for them too. In verse 4, let, let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. God's word is clear. Marriage is to be treated with respect, honor, and as an institution of precious value. The gift of sex is to be expressed within the commitment of the marital relationship alone. That is the way God intended it. Call it old-fashioned. Call it out of touch with what people are thinking and doing today. It doesn't matter. God calls upon us to sacrifice. And so in a world of rampant pornography, television shows where sex and marriage are seldom put together, and a climate where, in which sex outside of marriage is seen as the norm, these words about keeping the marriage bed pure will seem quaint and out of step with modern life, but they are God's word. And they express our life of sacrifice and devotion to him. In verse 5, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night worrying about a bill that needs to be paid or about bill debts piling up? It's easy to do. One way to get back to sleep is to count. Not sheep, but blessings. Start saying thank you in a prayer for anything and everything God has given to you. Count blessings rather than fretting over bills. It will make for a better night's sleep. Or have you caught yourself wanting something new or better 
than what you have. We all have. No matter how good the things we currently own are, that is the allure of the television commercial to make you think that you've got to have the newest, the fastest, the largest, the shiniest, the whatever -est thing to make your life complete. It could be a house, or clothes, or jewelry, or a cell phone. Being content is hard, but once again, the secret is to thank God for what you have. Being content and not loving money is what our sacrifice looks like today. Are you getting a picture of what our sacrifices look like? They come in all shapes and sizes. It may be volunteering to team teach Sunday school when you would rather sleep in most Sunday morning. It may be making a casserole and sitting with a lonely neighbor when you'd rather be back to school shopping. It may be getting up a little earlier, going to bed a little later, or, or turning off something good on television because you've made a commitment to have devotion time. It can manifest itself in a multitude of ways through a multitude of opportunities that God places before us each day. Today's epistle lesson is summarized it well. Jesus made the once for all sacrifice for us on the altar of the cross. He sanctified us. And now that Jesus' sacrifice has sanctified us, we can live lives of sacrifice with our words and by doing what is good in God's eyes. Think of your life as a canvas and through your words and actions, paint a picture of what sacrifice looks like. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Father, in love and mercy you 
sent your Son to be our Savior. Jesus took our place on the cross and was willing to sacrifice all so that we could be forgiven and rescued from eternal torment. Help us to sacrifice in our own lives as we are called upon to be your children in this world. May our words and our actions let the world know that we belong to you and that Christ lives within us. Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, the giver of life, we thank you for all the mercies that you granted to our poor during his earthly life, especially for calling him to faith in Jesus Christ. Comfort his loved ones who mourn his death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and the happy reunion in heaven. Lead all of us to remember that we are mortal, so that we will ever prepare our hearts to fall asleep in faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Lord of the Church, we ask your blessings on our Christian Day School, as on Tuesday we begin another <coughs> academic year, help teachers, parents, and students work together so that there is growth in your knowledge and faith. Bring safely home those who are traveling over this last holiday weekend of summer. May they be rejuvenated for the busy fall season ahead. Bless us as we prepare to partake of the sacrament of your Son's body and blood. May it assure us of our forgiveness and strengthen us to live our lives in your service. This we ask in Jesus' name. The Lord be with you.
Uh, also, other things happening, we want to uh, start our Sunday school, but we do need teachers. Uh, we are desperately in need of people who maybe just, you can't teach every week, but you can teach uh, every other week. Uh, you can teach, you can teach sometimes. Call Denise Ayring or call uh, Paul Reich and let them know of your desire to do that. They are desperately uh, looking for people that want to start this up. Uh, we will be starting that next Sunday, the Sunday after. Next Sunday is campground, and so a lot of people are gone that next weekend. But in two weeks will be our Bible class and Sunday school kickoff. So before then, we hope we get all of our volunteers in place. Otherwise, look at the bulletin, the calendar, the newsletter for all sorts of information upcoming. And may the Lord bless you. May the sacrifice of Christ so move us to be willing to sacrifice for him.